Hey YouTube, welcome back. It's Nathan Daly. Listen, as promised, I'm doing a three-part video breakdown on the officers that initially made contact with the three suspects involved in the Maude Aubrey case. So if you haven't already checked out the first one, it was an interview with William Bryan. And this one is going to be over Greg McMichael. He is the father of Travis McMichael. And here is his initial contact with law enforcement. Okay, that's irrelevant. Um, you know, he's making that statement that he saw him the other night and he had his hands in his pants. So that's a way for him to try to tell the officer, insinuating that I believe he had a gun, which is why we brought our guns, right? When I investigate people, this is something that you would see sometimes with people who are very clever, right? What they try to do is leave you breadcrumbs and little nuggets to help you come to a conclusion that they want you to come to. He's not going to ask, why did you bring the guns? I know he's not, and I haven't even seen this body camera footage yet. But the officer is not, the officer is not going to ask him, hey, why did you guys bring your guns with you? Right. Because it's been insinuated. Right. He, he left this element of. Um, of a breadcrumb there for the officer to put the piece together for himself. What did he say? The previous or, or I've, I've witnessed him before and he had his hand in his pants. Well, why is that even relevant? What does it have to do with anything? You're trying to tr you're trying to assist the officer to come to the same conclusion you need him to come to to help your situation. But what we have to remember with Greg McMichael is that he was a previous law enforcement officer. And he was also a previous investigator for the DA's office. So one, he understands, right, elements of a crime. And he also understands what constitutes his self-defense. What he's doing is creating the parameter of why he felt the need to bring a weapon into this confrontation, if that makes sense. It's interesting, very clever, but I pick up on things like that. And to me, when I hear people do that, it are automatically makes me believe that they're guilty in a sense, right? Okay, well, let me not say guilty, but it, it does make me realize that this person has something to hide. Why? Because they're trying to explain, they're trying to justify why they felt they needed to do something, but they're doing it in a way that's roundabout and a little bit sneaky. Well, I grabbed my freak step bag. It's an old Glen County PD issue, by the way. When I was stop. Hold on, what? So we Hold take on. off. I jumped in. Hold I, on, let me. It's an old Glen County PD issue, by the way. Interesting. It's a shotgun. Let's run it back a little bit. Something I caught. On foot. I mean, he ain't jogging. He's hooked up. I run in the house. I said, Travis, the same guy that broke in the house down there. And who's Travis? My son. Got the shotgun. Okay. I said, come on, let's go. So Travis runs and gets his shotgun. Because the other night, the, the guy stuck his hand in his pants. And so I grabbed my fruit step back. It's an old Glen County PD issue, by the way. When I was out. And, uh, Another telltale sign. He talked about getting his, um, what do you say, his magnum, his gun. He went and got his gun. But 
you guys probably missed it. He then states that this was police issued, right? Why would he do that? Again, another breadcrumb, right? He wants to get the officer. He wants to he wants to, he wants to lead the officer to a conclusion, right? Very 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 manipulative tactic. And if the officer, I don't I don't know the mind or the experience of the officer. Um, but what does that do? He's basically saying to the officer, hey, listen, I was a previous law enforcement officer. If the officer doesn't already know that. He he knows it now because he just stated that, hey, this was a weapon that was issued through the police department. That's basically what he did. He's trying to gain favor from the officer. Very interesting. Because here's the thing. If you're a legal gun owner, it doesn't really matter where you got the gun from. But if you want an officer to side with you, if you believe that the officer is going to side with you, you would make a suggestion like, oh, hey, you working. What I would see often is people say, oh, hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm, you know, the mayor's brother or hey, I'm so and so's uh, husband or hey, yeah, I um, work for what you call it or hey, I work in the Grady Hospital system doing this. Like, you know, you do these things in order because you want to try to uh, get the person to show you a little bit of grace and mercy. So you, you name drop or you talk about your affiliation. So very interesting. Hmm. So we take off. I jump in. My, my grandson's car seat is in the, in the front. Uh -huh. So we can't move. don't have time to move. So I kind of sit on top of it. We see him come around the corner. He's going down here. We pull up beside him. Hey, stop. Stop. We want to talk to you. And he just keeps on riding. And he's, he's looking at us. I mean, we're this close to him, you know. And he keeps on running. Then Roddy pulls out at some point. I don't remember exactly. The, Except for Roddy? Roddy. Or Roddy. Roddy. Or Roddy. <coughs> where, where was he? I, I don't know. He lives down the street here somewhere. Okay. Anyway, he pulls out. We went past his house. I think he lives the second house down there on the left. Anyway, we went past his house. The guy turns around and he starts running back this way. Roddy pulls out in his truck and kind of blocks it. So I said, Travis, go back that way. Storm will go head him off. So sure enough, he comes around. We come back down here, and he's right here. And he starts he starts running past us. Travis backs up and says, hey, stop, stop. We want to talk to him. Or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact words that was on the set. Okay, so they're chasing him. They're chasing him. And if the conversation went exactly, let's just take for face value what he said. They're following him around. The guy is running. They're like, hey, stop. We want to talk to you. Well, guess what? He keeps running. Obviously, the guy doesn't want to talk to you. This is where you start running into a problem legally, right? <clears throat> because if you take the same situation and you insert a female in it, now you have a woman and you have two men, three men and two trucks chasing this woman who's jogging down the street and they're cutting her off. They're keeping her from getting, you know, going to where she's going. Hey, 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 ma'am, stop. Ma ma'am, stop. Can you stop? We just want to talk to you. She doesn't say anything. She runs the other way. She's trying to get away. Oh, well, we got in the truck, went back around and did this and cut her off again. And listen, that would not be OK if, if the victim was a woman. Right. If we just let's even just take color out of it. Just in general, a woman. Right. No one would find that acceptable. The first encounter and you make contact with the victim, the woman, and you say, hey, ma'am, stop. I want to talk to you. And she walks away from you, tries to avoid you. The, the second time you try to make contact, that's harassment. Now you're harassing that person, right? That would not be OK if that was a woman. Point blank period. Well, nobody cares why you want to stop her. It doesn't matter, right? But I know that's a gender thing, but even this, even being a male, even being a teenager, it doesn't matter the age, people in general, you cannot harass people. You cannot. The sense of entitlement that some people feel like they have that, hey, hey, we're coming around here and we're telling you to stop. You're supposed to stop for us because we said so. Who are you? Who are you? The, if me investigating this, uh, the media, I'm like, okay, why are you guys... Why are you guys harassing him? That's not your job. Okay, so you stopped him. He ran off from you guys and ran in another direction. You followed him again. Hey, hey, stop, stop, stop. 
Okay, you kept doing this until, and then now we have someone dead. The first thing in my mind as an officer is, um, if you guys weren't harassing him, if you guys weren't following him, if you didn't get out the car with a gun, you were the only person who brought a gun to this harassment fight. And this person died because of it. To me, this is a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It's so interesting how this whole case unfolded. Um, but anyways, let's uh, let's keep going. I mean, by this time, I'm in the back of the truck. So the guy, I mean, he's looking dead at us, you know? I mean, he's like, me to you. And he turns and he runs. Travis gets out with the damn shotgun and runs up there. And, you know, I said, Travis, don't, don't shoot. Don't do anything. The guy turns and comes at him. And they start wrestling, and Travis shoots him around the damn chest. Very interesting. Um, here's the thing. Why do you need to get out with a gun? You know, I think that's one of the key things. And so what what made you fit one? Again, he said it earlier, but why did you even need to bring a gun out and a shotgun? You know, a shotgun. The way he's explaining the altercation it's as if they were minding their own business and Ahmad Arbery approached them with the gun out, <laughs> right? Approached them and harassed them, which led them to have to shoot him. It's so interesting. Again, this is this cognitive dissonance with a lot of people. What is the reality? The reality is you were chasing after somebody, regardless of what you thought they did. And then you're confronted or you you encounter the person, you make contact with the person after you cut them off and then you say that the person was shot because they came towards you. Man, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. I got to see the police report. I'm so curious to see what the police report says. And the, the guy was trying to take the shotgun away from him. He's got it on video. Okay. All right. Do me a favor. Hang tight. Yeah, I ain't gonna let me go. Uh, let me go. I would like to get his blood. I, I rolled. I understand him that. To check the, to check his pulse. Yeah. Or didn't roll him. I pulled his hand out, but he, he had his hand stuck up under his head. I pulled his arm out, and then I realized he didn't have anything in his hand, and saw that this, this ain't gonna last long. So, is there any way I can? Yeah, just give me just a second. Sure. Let me get some pictures and stuff like that, sure. and, and we'll get, sure. we'll get everything. Take you around, okay? Give me just a minute. Yeah, I was chief investigator with the DA's office for okay. 23 years, so I know what you got to do. Yep. I, know, I know everything, you know. Yeah, we're just, we're just. There we go. There we go. Wow. I, and uh, I didn't think he was going to do that, but wow, he did it. He just said, hey, I was the chief investigator for the DA's office, blah, 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 for X amount of years. He did it. He dropped it. Um, so that's interesting. I'm shocked. I didn't think he. I didn't think he said that. This is my first time seeing the video. This is very interesting. Hmm. And he talked about he checked the pulse and rolled the body over, checked his hand, didn't have anything in his hands. Very interesting. Again, you're talking to someone who is calm and confident because, in their mind, truly felt they're doing uh, something justly. All right. Yeah, if you don't mind. Interesting. Let me fast forward this. Johns. Yeah. 
Michael? Mike Michael. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. Michael. 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 And how'd you say you got your, that blood on him? He had his arm, but he, he went down, face down, and his arm was cut up underneath him. And I didn't know if he was going for a weapon or what, because at that point he was still breathing. Yeah. So I just, I pulled his arm out to, to see if there was a weapon in it. Right. And once I realized there wasn't, that's that's okay. the, only, the only contact I had with him. We get rid of the light, but you see it better. So he talks about... Um... <laughs> assuming he had a weapon on him, which is why he pulled under his his, his arm. <sighs> so he touched he touched Ahmad. He said he checked his pulse, pulled his arm to check for um, a weapon because he landed on his face. He stated that he was still breathing. He did everything but provide any type of emergency um, CPR or anything like that, which probably wouldn't have mattered because he was shot directly in the chest. check to confirm that um hmm. but what's interesting is that his his uh, him and his son's initial purpose for trying to apprehend because this is what they're claiming they're trying to do make a citizen's arrest was based off of some old video of him going in and out of that vacant um that home under construction but what's interesting to me in this case is that they see him, he doesn't have anything in his hand, he's empty handed, and he's just running through the street. I don't know. They could have just, they could have honestly just followed him and called the police and let the police do what they're supposed to do. Vigilante justice. Backs up and as he's backing up, he put the ass in his car into that road right over there. A couple nights ago. 
Yeah. Not to, okay. yeah. Uh, Rash was out here. Rash took the report. Rash has taken the report numerous times on this guy entering this, this house that's under construction. Okay. That has video in it. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, so the guy is, <laughs> as Travis is backing around, he's walking in the shadow to keep from, you know, to, to be illuminated. So Travis is trying to do it nonchalantly out like you can see. So at some point, the lights hit it. The guy hauls ass into the house. Travis runs down to the house to get me. We take off. I arm myself. He arms himself. We take off back down there. In the meantime, the owner of the house is a banker over, I think he's a banker, over in Alma. And he's got everything on video, and it pops up on his computer. Yeah. There's an alarm, on an alarm. Gotcha. And so he calls um, uh, Everybody Diego, but the police. another neighbor down the street. He says, Diego, there's somebody in the house. So Diego actually beat me down there. So Diego's walking around with a with a uh, 1911 in there. And I, I recognize Diego, and I identify myself. For those who don't know what a 1911, that's a, a pistol. Um, you know, again, he's saying, look, the alarm goes off. I'm calling everybody but the police. You know, we want to basically be private law enforcement in our communities. This is what happens, you guys, when people don't... I'm not going to go there. Damn, I don't want to get involved in a damn, you know, back and forth, so... Um, I got the Yes. Yeah, I, that's my son that, that shot him. I, I was at the back of the trailer, man. Okay. I, I need to get this blood off my hands. All right. All right. Can I go and let them, uh, AFDs? Yeah, they got you might just just finish in yeah yeah okay so anyway um where was i oh hey okay so uh diego gets there uh rash arrives no there's one other it's Rodney, the guy that drives that truck right there who has video you're looking at it right now thank you <clears throat> so anyway uh Okay, so with the rash gets here and two or three other officers. I don't know them. I used to know every officer down there, but right. since I retired, and you guys coming. And so I, I, we're all talking. <clears throat> we can't find him. We search the, the ground, search the backyards, everything. So he, he disappears. So, But I've seen these videos, so I know what the guy looks like. Black male. He wears short pants generally, a white T-shirt. He's got these little short dreads. I don't know what the hell you call them, but anyway. So I'm standing in my front yard just a little while ago. This guy comes hauling ass down the street. Like I said, I mean, like like something's after him. <clears throat> in the meantime, so I haul ass back in the house. I said, Travis, the guy's running down the street. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So I haul ass into my bedroom, get my 357 Magnum. It just Glen County PD issue, by the way, that I told you years ago. <laughs> there we go again with the police reference. It's cringe. That's a cringy moment when, when guys do stuff like that. Travis grabs his shotgun. Because we don't know if this guy's arm. Because the other night, the guy stuck his hand in, down his pants. Uh, it just led Travis to think he was on. <clears throat> and I don't take any chances. So we get in the truck. We get up here to this to this uh, intersection. See the guy heading down there. So we haul in. You get to which intersection? Right here. This intersection right here. What's With the guy's what's this road right here? Yeah. What, what is it? This road, right this road is, uh, I'm not sure what. What's the name of this road? Oh, home. Home. So you got this Holmes and Satilla? Right. He got, we, we got there, but he's running on down uh, Satilla okay. Drive. Okay. Or Burford. Excuse me. He's going down Burford. So we see him. Travis hauls ass up there. <laughs> tries to cut him off. Gets in front of him. The guy turns and runs. And so he backs up, and the guy runs again. And in the meantime, Roddy, the other guy in the truck, he pulls out and blocks it. So Travis says, he's going to run around the other way. Or he says, I'm going to go there. Could you put your hands real quick and get all the blood off? Uh, you start doing something yeah. you want to talk about? You hear me? You hear the other side? Thank you. <laughs> Look at this. This guy is giving people with the Confederate flag a bad name. <laughs> Look at that. Yikes. What if someone were to say, um, is that the Confederate flag on the truck? What if someone were to say, um, Ahmad saw the Confederate flag on the truck and, and felt he was being pursued by racist people, right? Like, what if, what if that's going on through his head? You see what he has on the front. 
I mean, that to me, that's that could be considered looked at as evidence as well, you know, and because there is this there is this perception that people who who have the Confederate flag or they have it on their car or in front of their home or people who um, had um, that because they're associated with makes them a racist, which isn't true. Are there racist people who have Confederate flags? I'm pretty sure. But that is the perception. So what if Ahmad is looking at this truck chasing him down and he sees a, a Confederate flag symbol on the front bumper and he's like, oh my God, I'm in fear for my life, right? Well, we can't ask him these questions because he's dead, you know? And so this is the problem with the case. No one knows how he feels. And like, again, this reminds me a lot of the Trayvon Martin situation. No one asked, what do you think this boy was thinking and feeling when he was being chased and harassed by this adult, right? Um, these are the questions that I didn't hear people ask, but um, very interesting. I just peeped that on this truck. Crazy. Especially with this hand just to check for a weapon. That's fine. That blood on my foot is mine. Okay. You'll have any okay. So anyway, um, where was I? So y'all, y'all saw him down here, cut him off? Yeah, uh, uh, so Roddy, Roddy cuts him off. I can see it. I'm, I'm looking at it. In the meantime, I jumped out of the car because Travis had jumped out with the shot to try to stop the guy. The guy hauls ass back. Roddy pulls out and, and, and blocks him. I jump in the back of the truck because I don't want to sit in that damn kid seat again. So I jump in the back of the truck. We haul ass around, come out this way. And at that point, I'm trying to think how it was. Anyway, the guy's here. He's running down an AM road, and, and, and uh, in the meantime, we're hollering, stop, 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 we want to, we want to talk to you. And it, uh, we get up next to him, and I said, stop, God damn it, you know? And then Travis jumps out with, a, with the shotgun, and he runs up here, and, and the guy, at some point, the guy uh, more or less attacks him. He runs towards him, and they get in a, damn, a fight over the damn shotgun, and bam! And then a second later, bam! So, I, you know, it was, it's all such a damn blur. I couldn't tell you exactly. I may have stuff slightly out of order, but... <clears throat> so, but how many shots were there? Two. Two? Yeah. You got somebody come over to get that off. Okay, good deal. Thank you. <coughs> all right. And then what happened? So you heard two shots? I saw them. Saw, I saw them. them. Yeah. In fact... Uh, if, if to be honest with you, if I could have got a shot at the guy, I shot him myself. Because he was he was that violently. Hey, I'll some water. yes. Wow. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> very interesting. He said, "If I if I got a chance to shoot him, I'd have shot him myself." <clears throat> what what Greg is saying is that. When his son jumped out the truck with the shotgun, he's alleging that Ahmad came to him and put him, put Travis in a situation where he had to defend himself, right? It's almost as if he forgot the whole, the, the entire five minutes prior to, right? That you guys were actually violating his personal space. You guys were actually really coming into his place of comfort, violating his place of safety. It was you guys. It was all three of you. And now, if really, to be completely honest, the way I see it is the real self-defense is on Ahmad Aubrey defending himself against three men who were chasing him in trucks and prevented him from getting away and not only that, when they tried to stop him, they confronted him with guns. And maybe in Ahmaud Arbery's mind that there was only one way he was going to survive, he had to fight. Even though he had a gun pointed at him. That this was his only opportunity and it was best that he tried to fight. And fight the man with the gun. A shotgun at that. No one is asking, what, what do you think Ahmaud Arbery was thinking? Man, this is deep. I do. Can you pour some water on my hand, please? We've got some. Uh, we've got some some wipes coming. Yeah, well, I, I just wear it. There you go. Here, get over here. We'll start one flat. Just let me get 
piece a little bit more tight. I got it written down here. Yeah. You got that guy's too. I haven't talked to him at all. Got it. In the chest, from what I understand, two times. Does he live around here? Not that I know of. The victim? He, he makes frequent trips to the neighborhood. He gets caught on video cameras like every third or fourth night breaking into places. And nobody's been able to catch him. And having recognized him from the video, I'd seen about two very long, or several days ago, I'm standing out in my front yard where he comes running by my, I'm not talking about trotting, I'm talking about hauling ass past my, my house. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting? Why does it matter how fast he was running? What if he's a sprinter? Like, preparing for a marathon. Like, why does it matter? You know how people will look at this from a racial standpoint? Is that, oh my God, as a black man, if you run too fast in certain neighborhoods, you look suspicious. That's what that translates to. You know, it's weird, right? Um, so it's very interesting. You know, if you're walking, hey, you know what? Ah, that black man was walking a little too slow. Maybe he was casing out the place, right? What is an acceptable speed to, because he said it, he stated in, in his statement earlier that this wasn't a jog. He was running. He was hauling ass like he was running from something. Ooh, very powerful statement. Very powerful statement. The question is, if you saw a white man run that fast in your neighborhood, that you are unfamiliar with, would you feel the same way? You know, these are the things people talk about. This is the, these are the things people talk about in regards to race. Sometimes it seems like a person's skin color is probably their biggest crime. You know, what comes into question a lot of times with people is that they feel like the color of their skin is suspicion. In a lot of cases, that the suspicion wasn't necessarily their behavior, but the suspicion was their skin color. That's, to me, that's how he comes off from his testimony. I ran inside to get my son. The guy that's, that's been, that we saw the other, or he saw the other night, I said, he's running down the street. So that's when we started trying to find him. And I, I, I left my damn my, uh, my cell phone, so I couldn't call anybody. Travis had his, but he was busy driving. So they came out here and started fighting or arguing? There, or? There, were, uh, they were trying to get him to stop. And uh, there was a, <clears throat> Travis had a shotgun, and apparently they started fighting over the shotgun. And yeah. Travis ended up shooting him. From what I understand, twice. I haven't been... Okay, yeah. You know, I knew every, every EMT and firefighter in one county back when, 10 years ago. Yeah. When I used to, uh, I was like that PD officer for a Again, trying to win favor. Um, he's now talked to the fire, um, the, the fire department. He's talking to them and he's telling them that, hey, I used to work in the fire department. Yikes. Yeah, that's a, that's a sign of, um, and from my experience, doing things like that is a sign of guilt. And it's showing through the need to be accepted, right? Like, I need you guys to, to feel more comfortable around me, be on my side. So what do I have that can relate, right? Hey, I used to work as a firefighter. Oh, hey, my dad was a fire chief. You know what I mean? Like, you say things like that because you want to create some form of bond or some form of a kinship, right, with, with the person that is essentially judging you. Right. Because that's exactly what an officer's job is to do is to, I know, quote unquote, judge per se, but to investigate. So it's easier when someone is somewhat on your side. Right. Whether unintentionally, subconsciously, you're winning a person over subconsciously. That's kind of think of it like that. Very, very manipulative tactic. But a lot of times people who are guilty um, of something or feel guilt tend to do that in my experience. So don't quote me on it, but from my experience, I've noticed that. Uh, and that to me is always a very good indicator that that person is someone I need to pay uh, very close attention to.
All right, Mike, fast forward. Looks like that might be it for the initial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think we're all getting small pieces. I'm going to just cut it there. Um, that's pretty much the, that pretty much concludes the initial contact that the officers made. So you've heard his raw testimony, his explanation of what took place and his involvement. So thank you for checking out the video, like subscribe, and even share comment. We'd love to hear what you guys think about this incident.